Now, there is no one in the history of professional wrestling who can match The Undertaker for longevity at the top of one company. His constant adjustments to his costume, in-ring style, or storyline motives kept him fresh, even if they did not always change the character for the better. I'm Jules, this is WhatCulture.com, and this is The Undertaker, every reinvention ranked worst to best. Number 10. Purple Glove Undertaker for over three years following his debut, The Undertaker did little to change his gimmick or in-ring style, but remained one of the most popular stars in the WWF. Overcome by injuries and needing a break, he disappeared after the Royal Rumble 1994, and in his absence, another person who manager Ted DiBiase claimed to be The Undertaker began appearing on television in the original grey gloves and boots of the Phenom. Paul Bearer would soon announce that his Undertaker would return to face this imposter at SummerSlam. If anyone was in doubt as to how fans would decide distinguished between the two, well, they found their answer when Paul Bearer introduced an Undertaker who had swapped grey for purple. He shortly destroyed the fake Undertaker and would continue to sport the purple and black colour scheme for the next two years. Only a minor change in colour design, Purple Glove Undertaker saw no changes in Taker's in-ring style, which stayed slow and pondering until his 1996 feud with mankind. Other than distinguishing this Undertaker from his imposter, this changed little in the character. Number 9. Ministry of Darkness Undertaker Still one of the WWF's top stars as the Attitude Era propelled the company ahead of WCW, The Undertaker became a bad guy again in the latter half of 1998 for the first time in nearly seven years. Reuniting with Paul Bearer, he became the leader of a cult, recruiting many of Taker's real-life friends to create the Ministry of Darkness, a collection of mostly renamed disciples who did The Undertaker's evil bidding. Often appearing in robes and on a throne, this Undertaker spoke in Tongues, tried to marry a young Stephanie McMahon and crucified people on a symbol. With jet black hair and a double-pointed goatee, it was the most demonic version of the Undertaker character, although it often crossed the line into absurdity and sometimes went a bit too far down the route of bad taste. By this time, Taker was suffering from a multitude of injuries, which he got as a result of working hard to bring the WWF back to the top of the business, and the quality of his matches with frequent opponents, the Rock and Stone Cold Steve Austin, decreased with each month. Ministry of Darkness Undertaker would earn a third WWF Championship for the Phenom, but necessitated an abrupt change in character when he would return from a lengthy injury layoff. Number 8. Mohawk Undertaker by the early 2010s, Undertaker ceased to be a full-time performer for the WWE. With his WrestleMania undefeated streak growing in legend, he became a key part of the biggest show of the year, often reappearing in January to start his feud for that year's show before disappearing for most of the following 12 months. Each return would bring a slight tweak to his attire or persona, but his most arresting was his appearance against Triple H at WrestleMania 28. The pair had battled the previous year as Triple H looked to do what his best friend Shawn Michaels couldn't and end the streak, but had failed. A rematch was set, this time billed as an end of an era and inside the Hell in a Cell. Anticipation was high for the encounter as the two legends faced off. Taker then surprised everyone by removing his hood in dramatic fashion, revealing a shaved mohawk in place of his customary long locks. Although he would shortly grow his hair back, the reveal was stark and terrifying, adding another level of intensity to his character and his performance. That it seemed to make The Undertaker look younger than he had in recent appearances was also another positive, making Mohawk Undertaker a brief but rather memorable reinvention. Number 7. Phantom of the Opera Undertaker a prime example of Undertaker's impeccable ability to adapt to any environment or circumstance came in October 1995. You see, Mabel had been enjoying a run as a main event heel, but was developing a habit of injuring the stars he faced. He did the same to The Undertaker, smashing the dead man's orbital bone in a match. With the autumn of 1995 being a low point in WWF history, the company just could not afford for Taker to take time off. As a result, he returned at Survivor Series with a protective mask. Revealing the Phantom of the Opera light covering before his elimination, match against Mabel and his team, the threatening face piece only added to the character's mystique, terrifying his opponents. Sporting the mask for only a couple of months, there was a sense of real disappointment when he removed the mask following the 1996 Royal Rumble. That event had seen him take on Bret Hart for the WWF Championship in the longest and most intriguing bout of Taker's career so far, a sign of the higher in-ring quality shortly to come from the Phenom. Although Phantom of the Opera Undertaker lasted only a brief time, it is fondly remembered, a sign of Undertaker's ability 
ability to take any situation and make it into a success. Number 6. Return of the Dead Man Undertaker Taking time off over the winter of 2003-2004, to The Undertaker returned at WrestleMania 20 with old manager Paul Bearer in tow to face his storyline brother Kane. The event was notable as it saw a much anticipated return to his phenom character after four years as the motorcycle riding American badass and big evil. He entered Madison Square Garden to the bells and organ of the classic version, with druids even lighting the way, much as they had done in his previous WrestleMania match against Kane six years earlier. Back in a long leather coat for his entrance, his hat was now much more of a cowboy style, demonstrating a hangover from his American badass days. Appearance-wise, it was a subtle yet welcome update of the traditional Undertaker character that fans had been longing for, and one element of this return to the old days was the revival of the classic Undertaker versus large and strange monster trope. Characters such as Heidenreich were created to be larger-than-life opponents for The Undertaker to destroy. As with the original run of similar foes in the early 90s, this led to poor matches from an in-ring standpoint as well as incredulous storylines that undid some of the good work that Taker had done in rebuilding his reputation as Big Evil. Now, This return to the dead man started out well but soon ran out of steam, ultimately making it a bit of a disappointment. Number 5. The American Badass Undertaker This was the most dramatic of The Undertaker's reinventions. Returning to the WWF in May 2000 after an eighth-month absence, Taker kept his name but changed everything else about his character. No longer an undead zombie, he was now a motorcycle-riding, denim-wearing Texan. His return in the closing moments of Judgment Day 2000 was wholly unexpected, his hair back to his natural color, sporting a bandana and sunglasses, and minus the classic Undertaker music. Taker's mystical powers had also disappeared. He spoke like a regular man, letting his native Texan accent take over, and he had feuds that involved his real-life wife at the time. It added layers of humanity to the ice-cold phenom of the previous decade. Although the overblown insanity of his Ministry of Darkness incarnation needed some correction, this was such an abrupt change that it resulted in the character losing some of its unparalleled mystique. Yet to return to his physical condition of 1997, the American badass often did not deliver in the ring. In addition, it was during this period that The Undertaker easily defeated rising stars such as Kurt Angle and Rikishi, as well as decimating any member of the WCW invasion that he encountered. Such annihilation seemed much more acceptable when portraying the supernatural dead man, but as a supposedly regular American, these hammerings often became frustrating. Certainly a memorable change due to its boldness, the decreasing match quality and demolition of exciting talent puts this reinvention squarely in the middle rank. Number 4. The American Dead Man Undertaker The Undertaker's move into cinematic wrestling with his Boneyard match against against AJ Styles at WrestleMania 36, to date seems to have been his final match. Fittingly, he unveiled another new interpretation of his character for this last ride. Although he may have only used this version of The Undertaker in one match and without fans to experience it, it was full of meaning for those who had followed his progress over the previous 30 years. Taker arrived on a motorcycle a la The American Badass and sported a leather waistcoat that fit the period of his career more. Yet the cinematic nature of the encounter allowed Taker to use the magic and the horror of his classic dead man persona. Shooting fire, destroying druids, and seemingly transporting out of graves, it had all the classic elements of the supernatural Undertaker, albeit in the bodily shape of a 55-year-old gunslinger. Due to the recorded nature of the clash, Undertaker did not appear tired or lagging in comparison to an AJ Styles who was at the top of his game, further helping the Phenom have a dignified and satisfactory final encounter. Encapsulating the different aspects of 30 years of character development, this American dead man creation allowed for a fitting combination of the best elements of Taker's numerous reinventions. If the Boneyard match does prove to be his final match, this summation of elements from his character's journey was a fitting way to end an unmatched career. Number 3. Teardrop Undertaker the Undertaker was reinvigorated in 1996 by his feud with Mick Foley's Mankind character. The pair fought each other for a good portion of 1996, creating some classic matches that were very different to the formulaic and plodding matches of the time. Adding new speed and aggression to his in-ring work, The Undertaker would, by the end of the year, add a new look in as well. After being buried alive at the October In Your House, Undertaker returned at Survivor Series for one more match with his nemesis. Descending from the rafters at Madison Square Garden with bat wings spread wide, Taker 
Jagger had ditched his trademark gloves, boots and hat and instead went for a leather outfit and most notably a prominent black teardrop painted on his face. Indeed, although the teardrop makeup seemed somewhat out of place for such a threatening character, this period of The Undertaker's career saw his greatest in-ring work to date. His clashes with Mankind, Bret Hart and in particular his classic bout with Shawn Michaels in the inaugural Hell in a Cell were excellent and a far cry from the plodding repetition of his early 90s matches with an array of monsters. Combined with excellent storytelling and his feuds with Michaels and Kane, Teardrop Undertaker was one of the character's best periods, redefining what the character and man was actually capable of. Number 2. Big Evil Undertaker Following the WCW slash ECW invasion angle of 2001, the WWF looked to change up its product and tried to arrest their declining numbers. Many wrestlers changed allegiances or gimmicks, defeated WCW stars began to slowly reappear on television, and new stars were being tried out. Prominent among these changes was The Undertaker turning heel again. Aligning himself with Vince McMahon, Undertaker did not return completely to his dead man persona, but added a more demonic side to his American badass character. Character. Ruthless and brutal, Taker kept his hair short for the first time, adding to the no-nonsense character that he was now playing. Destroying Maven after being eliminated from the Royal Rumble, kidnapping Ric Flair's son David in order to get a WrestleMania match with the Nature Boy, and dragging Hulk Hogan through the backstage area tied to his bike, Taker's new edge earned him another WWE Championship. More importantly, after the visible physical issues that had plagued the American Badass and Ministry of Darkness versions of the character, The Undertaker began to get leaner and more agile again. His encounters with with Flair, a young Brock Lesnar, and memorably a ladder match against Jeff Hardy were the best he had participated in since the Teardrop Undertaker of 1997. After a huge section of the fan base had become disenchanted with him over the previous few years, Big Evil ensured that The Undertaker would remain a popular and respected character, something that didn't actually look as guaranteed in the early 2000s. And number one, MMA Undertaker Around the mid-2000s, Undertaker got into the best shape of his career and adapted his in-ring style to match his increased athleticism. A big fan of MMA, Taker added a triangle choke to his repertoire of finishing moves and began wearing the padded gloves associated with professional fighters. He also transitioned into regularly wearing a singlet top, showing off his leaner and muscularly defined frame. Still sporting his trademark hat and overcoat on the way to the ring, once the bell rang, Undertaker had reinvented his style again to keep up with new trends. Having Classics with the likes of Kurt Angle, Batista and Shawn Michaels, the change in style and conditioning led to the best in-ring period of Taker's career. Looking on the verge of breaking down in the earlier parts of the decade, he was now one of the most consistent workers in the company, and added three more world titles to his name before the end of the decade as well as establishing the WrestleMania streak as a key part of each year's event. Updating The Undertaker's character cosmetically to maintain the original idea of the dead man whilst excelling inside the ropes, MMA Undertaker was not the most dramatic reinvention of his career but it was one with the greatest overall success. We spoke today about how The Undertaker reinvented his character again and again to provide us, the fans, with the best possible version of himself. And you know what? We too should take a lesson from that and always look to try and improve on what we are, who we are as people. Whether it's physically, mentally, or spiritually, trying to approach each day with the goal of ending it slightly better in any of these regards is a very positive move to make. And I wish nothing but the best for you, my friend, and I hope that you achieve your life goals, whatever it is you're getting up to. Big love to you. Now go out there and absolutely smash it, you big ledge. And there we go, my friends. That was The Undertaker. Every reinvention ranked worst to best. I hope that you enjoyed that and let me know what you thought about it down in the comments section below. As always, I've been Jules. You can go follow me over on Twitter at RetroJ, but the O is a zero. Or you can swing by Instagram where it's the same handle. Hope to see you over there. And I'll speak to you soon. Bye.